morning, maybe good afternoon in some places. Welcome to the Lakshman Kadiragam Institute EU webinar today on the 3rd December 2020. Let me welcome His Excellency Dennis Chaibi, Ambassador, Delegation of the European Union, Sri Lanka and Maldives, and also thank you for hosting this event today. And also, uh, Mr. Thorsten, Deputy Head of Mission Delegation of European Union, welcome to the seminar. And Madam Anne Chatterjee, Deputy Head of the Political Trade and Communication Section, Delegation of European Union to Sri Lanka and Maldives. And the representing the French Embassy, Mr. Aulian, Deputy Head of Mission, French Embassy, and Madam Suganti Kadiragama, members of the Lakshman Kadiragama board, the colleagues, good morning once again. I am happy to be invited to talk to you this morning about a topic which is very close to our heart, topic which is very close to my heart, being an ex-naval officer. We know that we live in the COVID-19 world and we are all waiting to use the term post-COVID world. But so far, unfortunately, it is an elusive world, not yet there. Now we are talking about vaccinations. Many countries are producing. We hear about 95% success, 90%. And we are all waiting to see the affordability and availability of this vaccine to, the con to countries like Sri Lanka. One may wonder in the maritime related seminar why I start with the COVID. The reason why I said that is even during the COVID pandemic, the prominence, the importance and the attention to maritime domain in the Indian Ocean did not lose its sight. On the contrary, I would say it increased. When the countries were battling COVID, the strategic attention to Indian Ocean increased by many fold. So that is why I started with the COVID-19 world. We all know that the COVID-19 has really impacted practically all spheres of our activities, whether it is the global supply chain, whether it is port operation, whether it is the global maritime trade, everything is impacted, but we are trying to survive our best. But despite the maritime domain too, affected by COVID-19, the attention to ocean is still there. So this is the point that I'm trying to make. We all know that in the 21st century, we refer, to the, we refer to the world as the century of the oceans. And we also know that we refer to this as the Asian century. So what is the relevance of century of the oceans and the Asian century? We know that major part of Asia is directly or indirectly linked with the ocean, the sustenance, the development, the life of many Asian littorals or the many Asian countries are related to the Indian, uh, Indian and the Pacific Ocean. Now, this brings to the prophecy of Admiral Mahan, who said, whoever controls the Indian Ocean in the 21st century will dominate the world. And also he said, the Asia, Will the, the destiny of the world will be decided upon the waters of the Indian Ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, this prophecy is coming true. Now, let me change my topic briefly. If you recall in 1971, this small country called Ceylon, Sri Lanka, proposed to the United Nations that the Indian Ocean should be a zone of peace. There were three basic requirements at that time, preventing nuclearization of the Indian Ocean, preventing unnecessary arms race in the Indian Ocean, 
preventing bases being built up in the Indian Ocean one against the other. The whole world acknowledged it and the whole world said yes to it, ratified, but it did not succeed. Fast track 49 years, what do we have? A heavy nuclearized Indian Ocean, heavily militarized Indian Ocean, and large number of military bases. But we conveniently change the word from bases to places now. So not necessarily you need to have a military base. It can even be places. Now, Sri Lanka, because our key topic is Sri Lanka and the Indian Ocean, maritime trade, and the, how we uh, region and the European Union can work together. Sri Lanka is geographically a small country, only 65,000 square kilometer of land. 1,400 kilometers of coastline and 22 million people. And we are a developing country. We were ravaged by a civil war for three decades, which retarded our economic progress and the development progress. That bloody conflict came to an end in 2009. And of course, 10 years down the line, we were again subjected to the most horrific terrorist act in the country, which is the infamous Easter bombing. Now, what is the situation in Sri Lanka? There is a new president, new government, with a huge political mandate. Now, when you talk about Sri Lanka, there are two things that we must never forget. Number one, how close Sri Lanka is to India. Geographically, we are very close to India, and in, we all know that India is the biggest country in the region, the powerful military in the region, and 7,000 kilometers of coastline. So one factor which is determining our strategic outlook is the close proximity to India. That is on the north and the northwestern part of the country. What about the south? You go to down south and look from your coastal villa, you will see large number of ships passing by. And if you really count, it's about 300 merchant vessels passing just south of Sri Lanka. So that is a huge point uh, in our strategic outlook. Now, we are facing through a huge economic issue. Because of the pandemic, we are going through a very difficult time. The world is going through a difficult time economically, and I think we will be worse affected. And that is why countries like Sri Lanka needs a new economic outlook. Look at the ocean, untapped potential in the ocean. Now, when you have a situation like in Sri Lanka, our foreign exchange revenue has gone down and our expenditure is always increasing and how are we going to manage? And we are also having a huge debt to repay and our debt to GDP ratio as of now is about 86.5%. So that's a huge challenge country like Sri Lanka is having. My point is, as I see it, the only way or the best way for Sri Lanka to come out of this situation is to look at the potential in the ocean. Look at the potential in the ocean. We are blessed in the Indian Ocean to have deep water ports and very close proximity to sea lanes of communication. Unless we capitalize as a country these two factors, the deep water ports and the close proximity to the sea lanes of communication, ladies and gentlemen, we will have problem. Now why I said all these things about Sri Lanka, and I do believe that I represent the voice of at least 28 countries in the Indian Ocean region. The smaller, less militarily powerful, less economically powerful, countries in the, old, uh, in the Indian Ocean. Now, in order for 
littorals of the Indian Ocean to benefit from the Indian Ocean, what do we need? Number one, we need a rule-based maritime order. Number one, because we have a huge asymmetry. The countries are different in size, geography, economic, military. The best way to overcome this huge asymmetry is to have rules. Everybody abide by, everybody follows the rules. We also need peace and stability. With a rules-based maritime order, we need rule, peace and stability. And very importantly, there is no point having peace and stability. There is no point having rules-based order unless we develop our maritime related infrastructure unless we get more and more connected to the global maritime trade. So with the rules-based maritime order, peace and stability, the next most critically important factor is we need to develop maritime related infrastructure and to become a key player in the global supply chain or the seaborne trade. Unless we can do that, ladies and gentlemen, sustainable development goals by 2030 will be a mere dream. Unless we use these three factors, industrial revolution 4.0 probably will be a dream. So ladies and gentlemen, the three key points I would re-emphasize, a rules-based maritime order, peace and stability, development of infrastructure, maritime related especially, and getting connected to the seaborne trade. Now, we in the Indian Ocean, what do we have? Do we have a rules-based order? I think up to a fairly a certain degree, we do have a rules-based maritime order. Do we have peace and stability? This is a big question that we have. Do we have peace and stability in the Indian Ocean? What we see in the Indian Ocean is insecurity of one country give rise to insecurity of other countries. And the net result is unnecessary arms race. Insecurity of one country give rise to insecurity of other countries, resulting in an unnecessary arms race. When I hear this, I would say Indian Ocean is the most militarized ocean in the world in the 21st century. At any given time, there are about 120 warships from about 29 different countries patrolling or moving across the Indian Ocean. And ladies and gentlemen, we don't know how many nuclear submarines, we don't know how many, how many submarines carrying nuclear warheads are there. So practically, we may be sitting on top of a volcano. Unfortunately, it should not, I mean, we wish, we wish it will not erupt, but that's the situation that we are in. Now, as I mentioned, insecurity, strategic competition, strategic convergence, we practically see every day in the Indian Ocean. Now this brings me to a quotation by the president-elect US Joe Biden. In his inaugural address, he said, we can be opponents, but we don't have to be enemies. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that is applicable to everywhere and pretty much so to the Indian Ocean. So what do we need finally? I would say we need an Indian Ocean order. Indian Ocean order, right? And I would say we need more regional cooperation and not merely cooperation, but collaboration. Now is the time to deliver. Now is the time to really walk our talk. We have been talking about collaboration, cooperation uh, for the last decade or so. But now, it's kind of now or never. In that sense, I'm very happy to announce that the tri-party, the National Security Advisor level meeting, which took place last week, was a great success. And we have great hope because India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, 
have joined hand. Of course, this was there until 2014, but six years it was in limbo. But now we have reinvigorated that. And we also have Mauritius and Seychelles on the other side as observers. And then we try to take Bangladesh on the Bay of Bengal as another observer. If we can have a maritime domain awareness covering these six countries, 90% of the northern Indian Ocean is covered. Of course, I'm not talking about the southern Indian Ocean, which is close to the penguins, but the northern Indian Ocean, if these six countries can work together on a maritime domain awareness, basically the objective is to know who is, who is there doing what and going where. That's the maritime domain awareness because it is said nearly 50% of merchant vessels do not report their position correctly. And a large number of merchant vessels do not have their automatic identification system on, switch on at all times. And 40% of fishing taking place in the Indian Ocean is illegal, unreported, and unregulated. That means we all are sea blind. We don't see what is happening in the ocean and we need to overcome this maritime domain awareness. And together with that, we need a huge effort to develop maritime related infrastructure. I re-emphasize the two, these two points because we need a rules-based maritime order, peace and stability, true, but at the same time, development of maritime related infrastructure. I will end my talk by saying Asia Development Bank recently released a report and said there is a requirement of 16 trillion US dollars to develop infrastructure in Asia up to 2030. And if we don't get that money, most of these countries are going to miss sustainable development goals. So ladies and gentlemen, together we can. Thank you very much.